Well, hey there. Welcome to the Kim Constable podcast. You can hear one smiling, can't you, in my voice? I have to say, I, uh, I love it whenever you can hear a smile in someone's voice. And I'm smiling because I get to talk to you guys and I haven't spoken to you for a week. And how the hell are you? It's good to hear from you. Well, you're not really... I No, I'm not hearing from you. You're hearing from me, but you know what I mean. You know what I mean, don't you? I love our time together here in the podcast. But I just want to say, like, I'm really sorry I didn't have a podcast for you last week because what happened? Well, to be honest, I'm going to tell you what happened. I was just fucking exhausted. If I'm, if I'm true, I'm speaking the truth, I was just knackered. And I had put uh, two podcast episodes out the previous week. I had done the bonus episode with the FBI negotiator, Chris Voss. If you didn't listen to that one, why the hell not? You need to get on to it. And then I did another one with the fantabulous Amy Porterfield. I mean, come on, please. If you haven't listened to that one, you really have to. It was so fantastic. And so then whenever it came to Thursday, we had worked so hard all week. I was absolutely knackered. And I said to the team, you know what? I did two last week so that bloody well just suck it up not have one this week. Well, it didn't quite go like that, but you know, I was knackered. So really sorry that we missed last week, but we are back this week with another fabulous episode, except it almost says a wee bit of a cop-out again as well, because I'm giving you, well, it's not a cop-out. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. So um, I recorded an interview with a guy called Shane Walsh, and he's a fitness uh, a fitness pro here in uh, in Ireland. He's, I think, in Dublin. Really, really nice guy. Asked me would I uh, be an interview on his podcast, and I was delighted too because I love being on my fellow Irish men podcast. And so he released the episode a couple of weeks ago, and I always listen to all my episodes that I record and all my interviews because I want to hear do I say um and ah and you know and you know and I do say you know a lot. I realize that and I have to try and stop putting in all these fillers. And I was listening to the episode, and it was recorded ages ago before Christmas, and I thought this is a really good interview. Actually, I sound quite. Sad smart in this interview. I sound kind of quite together, you know, like I know what I'm talking about. So I thought, well, listen, why that rather than just, you know, allow this, this brilliant stroke of genius be on Shane's podcast, I should bring it all over to mine as well. So that's what I did this week. I have, I asked Shane, would it be okay if he gave me the episode so that I could put it out as a bonus episode on my podcast? And of course he was delighted to, because he's such a lovely chap. And that is what I'm going to share with you this week. I think you're going to get a lot of value out of this. Not only is Shane just lovely, but um, we chatted about, you know, what it takes to build muscle, about, you know, the difference between boys and girls growing up. We talked about uh, women and in the workplace, and we talked about me building the business, and we really got kind of deep down and dirty in a lot of things. Not like, not like dirty, dirty. I know where your mind went there. Not that kind of dirty, just like filthy dirty in the trenches, you know? So wanted to share this episode with you this week. I thought you'd really enjoy it. And yeah, so uh, this is, that's, that's what it is. But here, listen, before we go, I have to tell you that the winner of January's podcast is... <gasps> the lovely Judy Bounds. Judy, congratulations. You chose a Sculpt and Shred program and I'm delighted that you did because you already have my Million Dollar Mentor program and you are in, I think you have a couple of other Sculpted Vegan programs and your review was just so absolutely beautiful and I'm so delighted to be able to give you uh, one of our Sculpted Vegan programs. And so guys, if you want to win a Sculpted Vegan program like Judy did, then you have to be in it to win it. Make sure you leave me a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. Send me a screenshot of the review. Here's a tip. Take a screenshot of it before you hit the send button or before you hit the, you know, the post button because quite often they disappear into the abyss on Apple and people are like, where did my review go? I can't find it. So take a screenshot of it before you post it. Send it to me on Instagram at the Sculpted Vegan. My team goes through the reviews and reads every single one and saves them and then chooses one each month and then we announce the winner on the podcast and like Judy you could win a Sculpted Vegan program even the $1,500 Sculpt and Shred so without further ado I'm not going to talk to you again at the end of this podcast I'm just going to let Shane finish it up but I'm going to go to the interview now with Shane the bonus episode that we're putting out um, of this interview I did I hope that you enjoy it wherever you are thank you so much for listening and I'll talk to you again next week for another episode of the Kim Constable podcast kisses from me to you love you all loads and talk to you soon gonna go to the interview now with shane hey guys and welcome to the next episode of the shane watch fitness podcast so this is an epic epic episode this is one of the guests that came in a lot when i did my recent uh, story and question box so this week's guest is kim constable uh, which is at the sculpted vegan on instagram 
Kim is an entrepreneur, a vegan athlete, mum of four, nearly 400,000 followers on Instagram, host the Kim Constable podcast, started as a yoga teacher, and in December, in October 2017, she founded the Sculpted Vegan, which is the world's largest online vegan bodybuilding company. And they have loads and loads of products, loads and loads of uh, programs and online programs for, for people. This is an epic, epic episode. We talk about how she got into competing, the power of having a coach, both for business and for for co- for her own uh, training as well, showing up when she doesn't want to. Uh, talks about kind of homeschooling the kids and the, the, the stuff that the ideology is about that. We talk about kind of having a goal, having and uh, locking that in. Showing up is the hardest part for a lot of people and that is the big thing that we lack, We a lot of people lack. We talk about kind of the media and how it's gone from potentially the kind of the, the media has led us from say the, the for for girls in particular from the Kate Moss look to wh- where we are now which is kind of looking to build a little bit more muscle and Kim Kim is a bundle of joy says it how it is this is a raw and unedited version and I cannot thank Kim enough for coming on so guys hope you enjoy the episode Kim thank you so much for coming on to the podcast how are we I am delighted to be here and I am fantastic. Thank you. And it's so nice to hear another Irish uh, accent on a podcast. I love doing uh, podcasts with my fellow Irishmen. Yeah, like I, I I came across Kim from Brian Keynes, who is a good friend of the show. And I've listened to her podcast as well, which is the the Strong and Sculpted podcast, which is incredible. She's had the likes of Trisha and some other amazing guests on. So Kim, you were one of the most requested guests to come on to the podcast in the last few weeks. So I had to reach out and try and get you on. So thank you so much for doing this. So I'm going to let you take over the microphone. I did a brief intro and how you kind of got into the realm of fitness and competing because it's not the, some for some people, it, it's, it's the next logical step when they start training. For, and for other people, it's, I can't kind of like the Mecca. So how do you kind of get into the whole fitness and competing thing? Well, I'm the kind of person, Shane, to be honest, that if I'm going to do something, I'm going to kind of do it to the max. You know, like there's no, there's, there's no half measures with me. My family always laugh and say, oh my God, here she goes again. Like as soon as I get my <laughs> teeth into something, I go at it full throttle, hammer and tongs. There's, you know, no holding me back until I'm completely full up with it. And then I move on. And so, um, so that's kind of what happened. Like I didn't start training in the gym until I was 37, believe it or not. Um, I'm 41 now. And I was a yoga teacher up until that. I was always fit. Like I'd done Pilates for many years. I taught Pilates and then I went into practicing yoga. I became a yoga teacher. And then um, a lot of people who have listened to me for a long time do know my story about how I at 37 years of age, mother of four, walked through my yoga room one day wearing only a thong and a, a, a bra top for the gym and went into my yoga room to get something. I had a, a yoga, a small yoga studio at home, and which was a converted bedroom. Really, it sounds terribly grand, but it really wasn't. And I went in there to get something from one of the drawers. And I, you know, as you do, turned around to look at my butt in the mirror. The sun was streaming in. It was April. Bikini season was nearly upon us. And I thought, well, you know, just have a wee glance there and see what's happening. And I'd never, ever liked my butt. It was always the one thing that I never really liked about myself. And as I, you know, glanced at it in the mirror or kind of stared at it in the mirror with, you know, the full sunlight beaming upon it, there was nowhere to hide. I realized that at 37, the skin was starting to get really kind of soft because that's what happens as you get older. And there was no muscle in there to fill it up. But I didn't even really think that at the time. I just kind of thought, oh my God, my skin is getting really saggy. It looks like an old woman's butt. And it's, you know, and I I remember my dad always saying, my dad has these great sayings and he used to say, you know, there comes a time in a woman's life when she has to choose between her bum and her face because, (laughs) you know, if you have like a, if you have a fat arse, you usually have a fat face and you have no wrinkles and he always should say there's no wrinkles on a balloon, but it's true. You know, if you have a fat face, you've no wrinkles, but if you have, you know, then you also have a fat arse, but if you have a lovely slim bum, then you've, you know, slim face and you have loads of wrinkles. And so that kind of stuck in my mind at the time. And I thought, you know what, I have come to this, this point here where I realized, and I'll tell you what it was. Shane more than anything. I was I was a yoga teacher. I was, you know, had a yoga detox company. Wasn't doing that well, to be honest. It was, you know, making maybe five figures a year. But I um I wasn't, you know, doing a lot with detox and nutrition. I but I was only eating like twelve to fourteen hundred calories a day. So I really wasn't eating very much. I kind of lived on this semi-starvation diet and I kind of prided myself on the pack on the on the fact that, you know, food never tasted as good as skinny feels. That was kind of one of my mantras from years ago. And uh, I realized in that moment that I couldn't lose any more body fat because I was as skinny as I was going to get, but I, um, but I didn't want to get fat. And so I looked at my ass in the mirror and I thought, right, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to fill that up with muscle. 
And that was, that was what made me go to the gym. I, I downloaded a program from a very well-known Australian fitness model. The very next day, I printed it out and I went into the gym and it was a four-week program. And I believed that in four weeks, I was going to have glutes like Emily Sky. And I got a short, short wake-up call four weeks later, whenever that was not the case. But it uh, once I went into the gym, it kind of reignited, I guess, uh, or not reignited, it kind of ignited ignited a love of muscles that I had always had that had lain dormant for a long time. My dad used to you know, read a lot of the muscle and fitness magazines. And you know, he used to have a lot of the bodybuilding magazines. He wasn't a bodybuilder. I don't know why he had a lot of the magazines, but he did. And I used to look over them when I was a child. And so I'd always loved muscles. And I think once I started training in the gym, I realized, holy crap, this is what I have been like literally searching for my entire life. I loved pushing. I loved deadlifting. I loved squatting. I loved going you know, hard for three or four sets. And I loved how fast my body started to change because I'm the kind of person who pushes really hard into failure. And so because I was pushing really hard in the gym and I started eating a lot more, my body changed literally overnight. And so then of course, once I got into it, I was like, well, maybe I could compete. Maybe I could like, you know, how far can I take this? And so that's really how I got into competing. I actually competed one year, on one year to the day almost after I started training in the gym. I started in April, 2016 and I first stood on stage in April, 2017. That's madness because like when you normally hear say, uh, competitors and stuff like that they're like they have to do a lot of bulking in order to kind of get the muscle obviously obviously the yoga stood to you well and kind of getting like the, the core and the abs and the basic strength there but the, the genetics obviously was a huge factor you talk about there about kind of moving away from say the 1200 calories because that seems to be the magic number at that without selling sex a lot of girls go towards that figure when they potentially go on a diet and then they keep going back to it and keep going back to it how did you break your mindset away from that number and allowing yourself to eat a little bit more well here's the thing that i have realized now since working with like thousands and thousands and thousands of women the world over is that women it's not that women believe that kind of 1200 is the magic number it's that women truly don't understand the relationship between food and building muscle. They just don't understand. And so men, I think from, you know, a very young age, because, well, not even a young age, but men have a a much better relationship with food and understanding with food and its role in strength, because men have always kind of aspired to be strong. It's something that, you know, I think little boys are taught. It's something that's built into our culture. You know, men need to grow up to be big and strong and tall. And so I think that it's very much inherent in our culture that when you're young, you need to eat up all your foods. You'll go up big and strong and tall. That's what we tell our little boys, right? So men from a very, or boys from a very young age grew up with this mindset of eat up all your food to be big and strong and tall. So men have no fear of eating. Whereas I think women have this this fear of eating and it's simply because they don't understand. They don't understand the relationship between your metabolism, between building muscle, how when you have more muscle, your metabolism raises, which means you can eat more, the harder you train, the more you can eat. They don't understand that food and calories and carbohydrates especially are necessary for building muscle. And so for me in the very beginning when I started training in the gym, I didn't actually change my diet because I thought, you know, well, I know a lot about, in fact, I was actually quite, um, quite prideful, I guess, in it as well. I was like, well, I've been running a nutrition company for many years. I know all about nutrition. Like, what are you you talking about? You know, I really was, I thought that I knew it all. And I remember whenever I first went to train with my, with my first trainer and prep coach, and he said to me, um, I would have arrived and he would have said, what have you eaten today? And I said, and I would have said, oh, I was was so busy. I was teaching four hours yoga. I have four kids who I homeschool. So I was like flat out busy, but I still made time to train four or five days a week with him. And I would, I would arrive in and I go, well, okay, I had a protein shake this morning and what's in it? Just protein and water just protein and water. Yeah, just protein and water. And, and I was like, and then I had a protein shake at lunch. And then I had a cold bowl of porridge that I'd made earlier in the day that I hadn't had time to eat. And then I had that this afternoon. And he's like, that's all you've eaten all day. I'm like, Curtis, don't have time to eat any more food. And so he then began to say, okay, here's the thing. See if you want to stand on stage next year, you have to bulk hard. You've only got like seven, eight months here. You're going to have to eat, Kim. You can't, you know, if you want to build muscle, you're going to have to eat. And I was like, really? Like, what do you mean I have to eat? I just truly did not understand the relationship between food and building muscle. I didn't honestly understand that you, in order to build muscle, your body has to repair muscle, rip it apart, repair the muscle tissue and grow. And to do that, it needs energy. And where the energy comes from is calories. And so once I then understood for me, it was like a light bulb. I was like, oh my God, so I actually have to eat to build muscle. And he was like, yes. And I was like, well, what if I get fat? And he was like, well, what if you do get fat? You'll shred it off before the stage. So I think what a lot of people don't understand as well is, is that whenever you, um, whenever you eat to build muscle and then you put on a little bit of what we call it fluff, you know, girls are always 
always afraid of putting on that fluff. They always want to stay lean. I never really went above about, I think the highest I got in that first year of building was about 20% body fat which is still very low. Now I don't go above about 16%, even in an off season, because I have so much muscle. And so, but I went up to about 20, maybe 21% or whatever, but a little heavier than what I was used to. But I was happy to do that because I went very deep into research as I do when I take something on. And I realized that when there's a, when you put on a little bit of body fat, it just means that you've eaten enough calories that your body has used all of those calories to build muscle. And it has a little bit left over for surplus. So if there's a little bit left, over for surplus and you're putting on some body fat, it means that your body, your muscles have utilized every single calorie that they possibly can in order to build that muscle. And there's a little bit left over. And so once I understood that relationship, I was like, okay, well, I'm happy to put on a little bit of extra body fat because I know that it's feeding the muscle. So I think many women just don't understand the relationship between eating, building muscle and a little bit of surplus. And then also they don't understand that the more muscle you have, the far easier it is to shred. I can do a shred now. I can be stage ready If I go hard, I can be stage ready in six weeks at any point of the year. And so, and I mean stage ready, I mean down to like, you know, 10 to 12% body fat. So, and that's only because of the amount of muscle that I have. So in order to build or sculpt this amazing physique that many women want, they don't understand that you have to go through periods of building and periods of shredding and periods of building and periods of shredding. And you have to sacrifice a little bit of the body fat during the period of building to build the muscle to then shred it off again afterwards. It's kind of a cyclical process and you can't be forever on a diet. You know, you have to be, there has to be periods of on and off and on and off in order to reset the metabolism and get the best results in the long term. But I think if more women understood that, they wouldn't be scared to eat. And I think that's what stops them. It's actually a misinformation or a lack of information that that stops them from eating more and then getting better results. I love the way at the beginning you kind of talk because if you got from growing up as as a lad, you would have looked at magazines, so like Swarno Schwarzenegger, you would have looked at WWE, and there would have been an awful lot more lads, kind of like jacked or big and stuff like that. And then you would have, say, like China or Trish Stratus and WWE kind of coming in, and they would have kind of been kind of like the first ones to do that, uh, in kind of coming in as a female, kind of look, looking strong. Uh, but now that seems to be on the mainstream. Yes. What do you think has changed? Do you think it's the education or do you think it's the social norms or society's norms have changed? Do you mean in bodybuilding in general, like competitive bodybuilding? Or girls, just- girls putting on muscle. Girls putting on muscle. Yeah. I, do you know, I think that everything, like anything in life, is just cyclical. I think in the 60s, you know, in the 1950s, women were homely and round. And then they decided to rebel against that. They didn't want to be homely and round anymore. They wanted to be independent and free. So then Twiggy came in and, you know, girls went into the super skinny mode. And that went, you know, the 60s and 70s. And then we had the supermodels of the 90s who were a little bigger. You know, the, the Cindy Crawfords and the Naomi Campbells, Christy Turlington. They they certainly weren't as skinny as then the next wave of supermodels that came that were, you know, in the noughties that were, you know, super, super, super skinny whenever size zero became the new, the new norm. So I think that for, you know, I I think more than anything, it just is, it's trend based and it's cyclical. And I think that, you know, now women are moving towards, you know, the more of the being strong culture. I think that the gym is no longer a place just for the men, because I think gyms were always a place just for men before women were intimidated by the weights room, intimidated by the dumbbell section. Whereas now, I think it's just becoming more and more and more the norm. And so therefore more women are embracing that. Like I have a 10 year old daughter and we have a a PT who comes to the house twice a week. We have a gym in the house, just a small home gym. I don't train in it, but the kids train in it. And we have a PT comes to the house twice a week. And my 10 year old daughter the other day was showing me her progress pictures. And she was like, look, mommy, look, this is whenever I started training with Corey. And then this was after six weeks. And then this is now, and she's now, she's obviously watching me because I'm a professional athlete. So I'm constantly taking progress pictures or just, you know, for Instagram and whatever. So there's no, but there's no shame in it for her. It's not like, you know, she's not taking them to assess her physique or see how fat she is or whatever. For her, it's a data point. It's a curiosity data point. Where was I there? It's measurement, you know, where am I now? And so it's starting even this young, like her friend Emily comes and trains with her as well at the house. And the two of them are doing glute bridges, like proper full on workouts with barbells, dumbbells, you know, squatting, um, as well as some, you know, interspersed with them hit stuff sometimes for fitness. And she's 10 and she's already now training in the gym 
and you know taking progress pictures and being a lot more conscious of being strong and not being skinny or not trying to lose weight or you know be emaciated or whatever now of course she does have me as a mother so, so her, her her data points are a little skewed you know compared to the average girl probably um but i think that it's it's it very much is a cultural thing and also then of course you've got the whole you know like the the rise of the bikini athletes and the stage athletes and bodybuilding competitions aren't for the elite anymore they're they're not everywhere you know and so i think that it's just as a culture the whole sport is becoming much more accessible much more widely available and women generally just want to be strong and not skinny it, but it, it may it may swing the other way in a few years you don't know but definitely for the minute i'm enjoying i'm enjoying that the move towards the strong and not skinny because it supports what i want to see in the world i guess i love that about the, your daughter at, at, the, at the age of 10 years of age getting into the gym and stuff like that because i always talk about my clients who are parents and like they're they're leading by example if they're using negative connotations or they're talking about food or themselves in a negative way the kids are going to pick up that and bring that to their kids and generations 100%. and generations so i love that that that's being knocked on with your kid and she's using it as a data point rather than I don't like how I look. So that's no. huge. Here uh, in our house, let me tell you, Shane, having a big ass is a compliment in our house. <laughs> my kids will go, mommy, your butt looks really big in that. And I'll go, oh, really? Do you think so? And she's like, mommy, it really does. It looks massive. I'm like, ooh, thank you. And I get like all excited, you know. And she goes, mommy, look how big my butt is. And I'm like, oh, you're such a gorgeous big butt. And I'm like grabbing and squeezing her glutes. And, you know, we have so much positive body image in our house. You know, the, the kids see, you know, Ryan, my husband, was worried whenever, whenever I was was, you know, started competing years ago, he was like, oh, I don't want, you know, because I was constantly assessing my progress and taking pictures and, you know, and, and assessing my glutes and my quads and, you know, and, and lagging body parts. And he was worried that I was going to be giving some kind of negative body image to, to Maya. We only have one daughter. We have three sons and one daughter. And he was worried. And I, and I said to him, but you have to understand, Ryan, I said, it's not, I am not criticizing my body. At no point do I ever look in the mirror and say, oh my God, my, I'm too fat or my stomach is fat. Or, you know, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm critiquing my physique. I said, but there's no emotion involved. There's no negativity involved. It's simply an observation. And so I'm not teaching her to hate her body. I'm not teaching her to be conscious of it. I'm teaching her to observe her body and observe the changes and essentially become body aware and body conscious, which I think is missing in so many children these days. And so we never comment on our children's bodies ever. Sometimes I want to, you know, you see them putting on a wee bit of body fat, you know, if you know they've been eating too much shite and you're like, oh, you know, and you want to say something and, you know, I, want, I really have wanted to say a few times, you know, don't eat those crisps or you get fat. And I have to literally bite my tongue, you know, to say nothing. But you never want to say anything like that to your kids ever because that just you know the, you do not need that stuff being downloaded to them so I'm so conscious of never downloading anything negative to them and just trying to you know help them to be really super conscious of what they put into their body their relationship with food their relationship with their body you know and, and just you know putting an effort and getting a result I think that that's what I very very much focus on with my body with my life and what's it's what I try and teach my kids. Did you have to work on the whole side of how you talk to yourself regarding body image and as you call it critiquing? But I think sometimes when people hear that word, they hear criticism as part of it and they kind of go negative connotation quite easily. Did you find that you had to work on that quite drastically or was it an easy enough transition for you to make? It's probably two things I would say, you know, um, the first one is I definitely, I grew up in a family of fat shamers. Like I have to say, I've worked very, very, very hard to, you know, overcome a lot of my um, emotional limitations that have stopped me being successful in all areas of life, which is why I am super successful in many areas. But um, so as a child, I grew up in a family of fat shamers. And even my dad today, if he sees and he'll say, oh my God, look at that great big thing. Look how fat that woman is. And I'll say, dad, you can't stop saying like, that's terrible. You don't know that woman's struggle or that guy's struggle. You know, you, do, you can't, but he was fat shamed a lot. My grandma was the worst, you know, his mom. And so I definitely had a lot of fat shaming downloaded to me. And I have to be honest, for many, many years, I was just terrified of getting fat. Now, am I, could I say I'm completely over it now? I'm absolutely integrated and unified around that? No, absolutely 
absolutely not, because that is what I do for a living. But one of the things, you know, I always teach my people, especially in business, is that your biggest weakness is also your biggest strength. So I am ter- I have two things. I'm a terrible perfectionist, like a perfectionist to the highest, to the nth degree. But that's because my dad's like that, and that's how we were all brought up. Um, and so that is a, a great weakness of mine because I'm co- constantly striving for perfection, but it's also a massive strength because I'm constantly striving for perfection. It's the same with um, with being terrified of getting fat. You know, like I, I've i never, ever, ever wanted to be, I was always so scared of being fat. And so, you know, I spent years and years and years and years under eating. But then what I realized was, well, I can actually build my body up and I can, you know, now I have, you know, an, an incredible physique if I do say so myself, but I've worked very hard for it. And it is, you know, for 41, I do have a pretty, a pretty muscular physique, which I've worked very hard for. Would I, would I let it all go and be overweight? Probably not. But, you know, you can say, well, is that a fear or is that an ethic? Probably a little bit of both. So, but then the other thing is um, to, to just expand on that a little, a great way to work on those negative body images is to have a goal that you're working towards. Many people don't have a goal. And I teach this all the time to women. Women walk around permanently on a diet and they'll say, you know, and I have people, I'm sure you do too, Shane. So I get on my Instagram all the time and they'll say, Kim, how much cardio do I have to do? And I'll say, well, would, would, well to do what? Well, to, you know, to, to, to lose weight. And I'll say, well, you know, well, what's your goal? Well, my goal is to lose weight. And I'm like, great, really specific. Well done. <laughs> you know, how much weight do you want to lose? How long do you have to lose it? What, and, you know, is it scale weight or is it body fat? And they're like, uh, I don't know. And this is the problem, especially with women. Well, it's also with guys too, but I see it with women constantly. They're not specific enough. They don't have a goal. So they're not actually working towards a measurable goal. They just have this fear of getting fat. And so they walk around permanently on a diet, punishing themselves. Oh, I shouldn't have eaten that. Oh, I can't have that because I'm on a diet. But without any measurable goal that they're working towards. So whenever you have a goal that you're working towards, you're happy to put on a little bit of body fat or you're happy to not eat dessert or you're happy to, you know, to eat 1200 calories if that's necessary for that stage of your diet, knowing that it's going to end. Like I've been down to 1200 calories before, you know, since I started competing, but only for like one week. The lowest I've ever gone for maybe two weeks is 1300 calories. I try not and drop below 15, 1600 calories when I'm dieting. And so, you know, you just, but I have gone down that low, but that's, I know that it's going to end in a week or in two weeks. And so I think that women's lack of goals in general, working towards a measurable goal is the thing that stops them from, um, from achieving well, great things with their bodies. But it's also the thing that keeps that fear intact. Whenever you're working towards a goal, there's no fear. It's either, will I eat, if I eat this thing, will it move me towards my goal or away from my goal? It becomes a decision point. It's not a fear of what will happen if I eat this? It's like, okay, well, let me whip out my fitness pal and put this muffin that I want to eat into my fitness pal. Oh shit. It's 650 calories. And that's going to push me way over my allocated calories for the day, which is moving me towards my measurable goal of losing 6% body fat in six weeks. So I'm not going to eat the muffin and you put the muffin back on the shelf, you know? So it becomes a decision point and not a fear. And I think that that's fear drives a lot of women, but they really need to get out of that and start working towards measurable goals. And it's life-changing when you work towards a goal, because then everything just becomes a decision and not a fear-based reaction, which unfortunately, Shane, is how many of us live our lives. Yeah, I think reaction is it happens to a lot, an awful lot of us. And I, I love the way that you've kind of brought up having a go because I always, my clients will listen to this and they'll hear this quote that I always flash around, which is a quote by a German philosopher called Nietzsche. He or she who has a why will overcome any how. And it is so important to latch on to what you want to do. And one of the goals that kind of has come in recently for, for whatever reason is a couple of my clients have started doing, say, photo shoots. Uh, particularly the girl, uh, girls wanted to do photo shoots. A couple that did, did them during lockdown, which was amazing. And that's, that's an achievement in itself, doing it during that weird time as well. Mm-hmm. Have you got any advice to anyone who wants to, to go down that route or where to start or where is a coach? Time, I know time is very, very dependent, depending on where people's starting point is, obviously. But how, where did you kind of start with that whole side of things? Well, I think that first of all, you know, I, I try and everything that I do or everything that I advise, advise or the programs that I sell, because obviously I, I now own the world's largest online vegan bodybuilding company, which I built while I was building my, you know, my body and, and all the rest of it. And so, you know, this year alone, we sold 30,000 programs this year. So I have a lot of experience now in dealing with many, many, many women who, who have these issues. And what the basis of all my programs is bodybuilding programs. Like that is, it, you know, we, they're professional programs for regular 
for people. Just a wee plug there for the company. <laughs> That's really okay. Fun. I'll do, but I'll tell you why I'm, why I'm saying this. And uh, I guess is because I think that what I've always worked with of the principle is um, you need to arm yourself with data. So I, I remember last year I had a woman who came on to, uh, I did a live, uh, a live training on Facebook and I was talking about, you know, the fastest way to, you know, burn, uh, burn body fat and sculpt muscle on a vegan diet. And this woman came on and she was like, oh my God, I'm so motivated. Right. That's it. I'm going to lose 50 pounds by Christmas. Now this was October right? Oh, wow. So this was the middle of October. And I was like, okay, girlfriend, you have like 10 weeks till Christmas. You ain't losing 50 pounds in 10 weeks. It's just not physically possible, you know? And so, uh, and she was like, well, why not? Like, I can, I can, I know I can. I was like, no, no, you may really want to, but actually you're not going to because it's physically impossible. You know, the body can sustainably lose, you know, two, if you aim for two pounds a week, one to two pounds a week, you're doing well. You know, I said, like, sometimes you may, you may go really hard at a diet for say eight weeks or 12 weeks, and you may lose a significant amount of body fat, but at some point your metabolism is going to downregulate and you're going to have to eat a little more for a couple of weeks or you know exercise a little less hit the reset button and then start again and so she was like oh really i was like yeah you, can, you have to understand the body so the first thing i would say she and you know to anyone listening to this is understand the human body first arm yourself with information you know research online watch youtube videos download programs read about how the body builds muscle how the metabolism works how the body utilizes calories, how the body burns fat, and first of all, see what's possible. And then, you know, look at your body and say, okay, well, where do I want to be? Is it that I just want to lose body fat or do I want to build muscle at the same time? Do I actually want to change my body composition? Do I want to look different or do I just want to lose body fat? Because many women, and this happened to me in the very beginning, you know, whenever I first, before I started bodybuilding, I always thought that all I needed to do to be happy with my body was lose body fat because that's what you're taught as women. You're taught lose fat, go on a diet, lose fat, go on a diet. That's what you're taught your entire life. No one ever says, go into the gym, work really hard, sculpt loads of muscle, and you'll be able to widen your shoulders, narrow your waist, grow your glutes, grow your thighs, and your body shape will change. No one teaches you that. Everyone teaches go on a diet. So that's all women do. And so I dieted and dieted and dieted my entire life until I hit 37 and realized I couldn't feckin' diet anymore. I was as skinny as I was going to get, and I still wasn't happy with my body. And that's when I realized I can change my body shape with muscle. So I think it's about really understanding, first of all, where do you want to go? What do you want to look like? The first thing I advise women is get a, get a picture of a body goal. Go on Instagram, like literally be a stalker on Instagram. Look up fitness models, look up bikini models, whatever physique it is that you aspire to, find someone whose physique you aspire to. I don't care if you're 52 and you're 20 stone and you've never been to a gym. If you find a picture of a 23-year-old fitness model with, with peachy glutes and long limbs and you think I'm going to look like that, you print that out and you stick it on your fridge and you look at that every single day. Now, you may never look like her, but you have to have something to work towards, something to aspire to and something to keep you going. Then when you know where you want to go, what you say is, okay, well, what do I need to do to get there? Is it just a matter of losing body fat or do I need to also build muscle? If I need to build muscle, can I do it from home? Do I have to go to a gym to have to find a trainer? What kind of program do I need to work? Is it a full body program? Is it a split body program? You need to get the data. It's almost like if you said, okay, I want to make a, I want to make a million dollars. Okay, well, how are you going to make a million dollars? Well, first I have to find an idea and then I have to build a company and then I have to, you know, and you would, you would work your way towards that million dollars. And it's the same thing with your body. So first of all, you have to decide what it is that you want, what's realistic in the time frame that you've given yourself. And then you just have to get going, you know? Like if you want to lose 50 pounds, it's going to take you a year to do it. There's 52 weeks in a year. Give yourself a year to lose those 50 pounds. Most people, when I say that to them, they go, a year? Yeah. A year? Like, what, what do you mean? I can't lose it in eight weeks? No, sweetheart, you're not going to lose 50 pounds in eight weeks. It's not physically possible. And so they're, they're unrealistic about what to expect, you know? Shane, here, listen, <laughs> I release programs all the time, right? Four-week shreds. We have women come on after three days and they go, I'm really disappointed. I followed the program to a T and I stood on the scales this morning and I haven't lost one single pound. And we're like, you've been doing the program for three days. What did you expect? Well, I at least expected that I would lose like two or three pounds. And what we have to say to them is, what if your expectations are not in line with reality? 
Women tend to believe their expectations are reality. If I believe it to be so, then it is. And we have to kind of realign them and go, no, 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 no. You're going to have to get a wee bit more data here. (laughs) Your expectations are usually out of line with what's possible. And how you realign your expectations with what's possible is by getting more data. How do you get more data? Do the bloody research. Do the work. You know, the, the work in the gym starts with the work in the mind first. You have to arm yourself with information you know, learn how the body works, learn how muscles built, learn how body fat is, is shredded and then be consistent. It's the biggest thing that women lack consistency. We call it the C word. I have a whole podcast on it called the C word consistency. Women are so inconsistent. It is unbelievable. But if they could just learn to show up for themselves every single day, anything is possible. So, you know, believe it'll take far longer than you think it'll take. Show up for yourself every day. Have no expectations of results. See everything as an experiment and just measure the data as you go. And one day you will get there if you just refuse to get up or if you just refuse to give up. But the problem is most women think it's going to happen in four weeks. And then they're disappointed when it isn't and then they give up. I love that about the C word because it is it is literally about showing up and my clients hear me say that all the time. Like even on the days you don't want to literally just even go outside for a 20 minute walk just to clear the head. That's yeah. still winning that day. That's your non-negotiable even get out, especially with what's going on. The gyms are closed for however long when we're recording this episode. But you like you have the consistency word there. You've and the consistency is also gone into your professional career as well, with the work mm-hmm. and the and the corporate stuff that's going on as well. Like the in relation to growing a business, the growing the business can be the same thing that a lot of people want the six figure big business or the, the million quid business yesterday when they haven't put the work in. Mm-hmm. Like for yourself, what three tips to someone growing a business would you give and why when it kind of, they, and also the mistakes that you've learned along the way, because there's always going to be mistakes along the way. It depends on what business you're going to build. I mean, I think that any business that you want to build, and I draw so many parallels between bodybuilding and business simply because I started my business when I started bodybuilding. I, um, you know, we turned over $4 million this year. Um, so far, uh, you know, in the first two, two and a half quarters of the year, we turned over, we've turned over $4 million. Um, I only started my business three years ago. So, you know, I built it at the same time as as building my body and competing on stage. And what truly the biggest thing that I have done is, first of all, I had a goal. I knew where I wanted to go with it. I knew I wanted to build the world's largest online vegan bodybuilding company, which I did. I knew I wanted to have a multi-million dollar turnover, which I do. And I just remained consistent to the process. I remain consistent to the process. But one of the other things as well that many people don't do that I do in bodybuilding, I train with a, a guy called Mark Getty, who is one of the um, the most successful, one of the biggest physically uh, bodybuilders in the world. He's won every major t- title in his federation as a pro bodybuilder with NABA. He's in the heavyweight category. He's like 22 stone. He's, he's massive. And whenever I wanted to build a lot of muscle, I was like, I just find the biggest, baddest fucker that I could find. Sorry for swearing. I don't know. It's a great <laughs> work away. Potty mouth. And um, I was like, I want to build loads of muscle. Mark Getty, you're the muscliest man I've ever met show me your ways leader, you know? And so I went to train with Mark and he was, and he taught me how to train to failure. And I draw a lot of par- parallels between bodybuilding training to failure and, um, and in business training to failure. And I, I take a lot of, um, I, well, I don't take, it's not that I take risks in bodybuilding. I don't ever take risks to, um, to injure myself, but you know, I would squat, uh, on an incline hack squat, I would squat 220 kilos for eight to 10 reps. And let me tell you, you can get squished like a pancake whenever you are, you know, I'm, what am I, 10 stone, 10 and a half stone. So, you know, in 220 kilos, what am I in kilos? 65 kilos, I think, 66 kilos. So it's a massive, massive, massive weight. So that's a big risk in a way, you know, now it's, it's a calculated risk because Mark is there spotting me or whatever, but I'm willing to go all in, Shane. I'm willing to go all in. And I think that many people start a business and they go, oh yeah, I want to, you know, I want to make a million dollars. I want to... I want to build a six-figure business and then they do a little bit today and maybe a little bit tomorrow and they go, oh, I'm not really sure. And what will people think if I do that video online? Oh, God, what my God, my friends and family watch it and they see me? And I'm like, who gives a shit what people think about you? I did this. I have a company called The Million Dollar Mentor. I launched it last year where it's just like a business coaching uh, program. And I did a live yesterday in the group. <laughs> I basically yelled at them all. 
I didn't yell at them, but I was like, um, we did a launch this week. I partnered with a girl and we, uh, it was a very, very last minute decision. And we, it was idea to launch in three weeks, which is generally what we do because I have such a big team. And I was talking about how, you know, I, I made a lot of mistakes in this launch because I just used the formula that we've been using all year to launch programs and business. And I, I partnered with her and I plugged her into our formula and I expected to make about half a million dollars. And I think we're limping towards the $200,000 mark. Now, that sounds like a lot. People are like, fucking hell, that sounds great, Kim. Well, it does, but you have to understand that's not a lot for the launches that we do in our business. And so I, I learned, uh, so I, I had a, we had massive, massive failure in the business this week. And I was, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is terrible. Like I thought this was going to be, this is actually far more work than I thought it was going to be and whatever else. And I was chatting to my copywriter, Alison, and she said to me, you know what, Kim? She said, do you know why you're successful? And I said, no, why am I successful? And she said, um, because you risk big. And she said, and because you take big risks, you you have massive learning. You you have massive failure. You know, the bigger you risk, the more you fail, the more you learn. And I think that that's where many people fall down in building business and building bodies or whatever. You know, whenever I decided that I wanted to build the, the best, you know, I wanted melon crusher thighs and a massive set of glutes. And I wanted a really spectacular muscled body. And I went to Mark and I said, Mark, what do I need to do? He said, you need to show up here every single day, five days a week and do exactly as I tell you. And I went, okay, done. That was three years, two and a half years ago. I have shown up to that gym every single day, five days a week for one hour, Monday to Friday, whether it's raining, snowing, I'm exhausted, I'm emotional. I've cried on the squat. I've got to the bottom of a squat with 180 kilos and burst into tears before. And, you know, and, but every day I show up, whether I've had sleep, not sleep, and I don't feel like it or whatever, I show up every single day, Shane. It's the same as in the business. You know, I show up every single day and I take calculated risks, but I take risks. I take risks and I'm not, I'm not afraid to risk. I'm not afraid to put myself out there. And I said to the guys in my million dollar mentor program yesterday, I said to them, guys, I said, here's the thing. I said, if I said to you all, right, if I said, I'm running a competition, the first person to get to a hundred thousand followers on Instagram, I will give a million dollars to and, and their ears all perked up, you know, and I was like, what if, I said, what if I ran a competition and said, I am going to give a million dollars to the first person to get to 100,000. I said, who here thinks that they could get to 100,000 followers or who here would give it a bloody good go? And everybody was, you know, it was in a live uh, Facebook live in the group and everyone was like, me, 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 me. And I was like, okay, so given now that we, you would give it, a, you would give it your all to get to that million dollars. Why the fuck are you not doing it now? <laughs> like seriously, you, there's a million dollars waiting for you over that hill if you're just willing to put in the work. So now that you've all said that you'd be willing to do whatever it took, why are you not doing it? And they were like, you're right. Like we haven't, we hadn't even considered that, you know, everything you want is on the other side of hard work, but so many people want it, but they're too afraid to go for it. Or they're too afraid to risk. Or they're too afraid of what people will think. And so they keep themselves small because of that. Whereas you don't even have to go all in the very beginning, but dear God, you have to show up and start and then commit to being consistent. Cause if you're not, you don't really want it. People say, I'd love to make a million dollars. I'm like, no, you wouldn't. I'm like, of course I would. I'm like, no, you wouldn't. But like, why would I not? I'm like, cause you're not doing it. You're not even doing anything towards it. So of course you don't want a million dollars because if you want a million dollars, you'd be putting an effort towards it. And they don't like that. They were like, well, well, no, I could if I wanted to, well then do it. <laughs> do you know, like, it's like, I don't, I don't sugarcoat it for people. So I think that's what I did, Shane. I showed up every single day. And, you know, I could give you all of these strategies. I could be like, well, you do this with your marketing, you do this with your website, you need to hire this person. Like I literally map out my entire business view. And I have three companies and we're launching, a, we're launching an apparel company next year. It's in full production at the minute. And you know, so I could give you all the strategies, but truly for anyone listening to this, who's trying to build a business, show up, do the work, do it consistently every day and refuse to give up. It took me eight years to build my business. I started trying to build an online business when my son, my last son was born. Sorry, nine years, nine years ago. That's when I first started a blog and I thought, oh, I might go into something online, try and earn a bit of money. Eight years it took me to finally to finally hit, well, I think I hit the million dollar mark after six years, but um, six years it took me to, to make a million dollars. It wasn't easy, but I never gave up. And I kept, 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 kept working towards it. And I didn't give up until I found the thing that I loved, which was bodybuilding. And that's when I was able to channel all my energy into that. And I made a million dollars in the first 12 months. 
That's, so, incre- that's incredible. No, because there's so many parallels between what you said about kind of when you're talking about people losing weight, about kind of just showing up. That's the exact same thing that you apply it to the bodybuilding, you apply it to the growing of the business. And I think a lot of people, as you said, are either fear of fear of failure or fear of whatever other people think. And as soon as that wall drops down, it becomes a hell of a lot easier because ultimately, if you're trying to sell for myself anyway, I can only talk for myself. My thing was it was once the whole fear of you're not going to be selling to PTs the PTs that have worked with you aren't going to be the people that buy off you at the end of it. So why are you caring what they think? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're like, that's you're, t- you're, I'm talking to say John and Mary down the road who have struggled with say those, I call them skimming clubs and trying to work with those style of people. I'm not talking to six pack Pete in the gym. Who's a PT who's been a PT for six years. So I don't really give a shit what, what they think or what they say. And that once that fear dropped for me, things started to click obviously there's still a little bit more to click but it still started to click if that makes any sense yeah, yeah. um yeah. in relation it's go ahead no, go no i was gonna say it's just like consistent effort over time people whenever they hear that the weight that i lift in the gym like i'm one of the strongest women that i know and and it's and they're like holy god like you shift some serious weight i'm like yeah but i didn't do this four years ago you know i was squatting 40 kilos 60 kilos was my top weight you know four years ago it's taken me time and energy and effort and consistency and discipline to get to where i am now but that's why i'm here i didn't start there four years ago yeah so. not and i think that is i think you, you, i think when people start doing anything they're like oh why haven't i got it already um and it's very easy to jump into that hole i want everything now we live in a now generation by clicking on amazon click now or buy now or whatever the button says uh which everyone's been clicking on like lunatics uh over the last little while you back to kind of towards the the kind of towards your your lifestyle and towards like the food and stuff like that obviously your name on instagram is sculpted vegan and uh i think veganism uh has been uh publicized both negatively and posit- positively in the media uh, and people have critiques of people have positive towards it. What made you go towards it and what has made you kind of stick to it, if that makes any sense? Mm, I went vegetarian actually for completely the wrong reasons uh, about 16 years ago. Like my best friend at the time went vegetarian and I was uh, too afraid of not being her best friend anymore. So I went vegetarian too. <laughs> so I would love to say, yeah, it's for the animals. No, it really wasn't <laughs> at all, but it's better to do the right thing for the wrong reason. So I went vegetarian 16 years ago. I find it very, very hard to give up meat. I really did. Um, I had many, many slip ups along the way uh, where you kind of, you know, you like shove a sausage roll in your mouth, you know, in the car when nobody's yeah. watching them and then pretend it didn't happen. You know, like you have all this shame around it. And um, whereas now I'm just like totally like, I just said to people, listen, nobody's perfect, rock on. But, um, and then I decided to go, um, I decided to go vegan. <laughs> it's funny. And this is how brutally honest I am. My trainer, Mark, always laughs. He says to me, Kim, the day you walked into this gym and I said to you, why did you go vegan? And you said to me, because I saw a gap in the market to make money. He said, my jaw nearly hit the floor. He said, and I knew, I knew then what I was dealing with. That there was, I would never have to worry about you lying to me or pretending that you were, you know, eating something that you weren't or whenever you're on prep or whatever. <laughs> it's because I've never known, thought you were going to, you know, give That's me a brilliant. Whole, because of animals and whatever. And it was like, there was two reasons why I went vegan. The first one was, um, I've all, health has always been a very, very, very high value of mine. Very high value. Um, and I, I never, I, I'm, you know what, Shane, I'm terrified of getting sick. I always just think, God, if I actually had some kind of, you know, or some kind of um, like disease, or if I had, you know, something which was untreatable, or God forbid, I got cancer or anything like that. It, I would be the worst patient ever because I am the most intolerant sick person you've ever met in your entire <laughs> life. I am terrified of being sick. I hate being sick. Being sick actually makes me angry. I get angry that my body just won't make itself better. And so I think that because I've always had this fear of being sick or being incapacitated in some way, because like I talk fast, I move fast, I, I'm a very energetic person, I'm a highly motivated person. And so anything that would stop me from being that way is like, I'm just terrified of it. And so so I, I guess that's always been a big driver for me. And I read a book years ago called The China Study, where um, it basically discusses, it, it's Colin T. Campbell, I think, wrote it. And it's, he's a scientist. And he he basically studied 
uh, or he realized through studying rats inadvertently doing some other kind of study that whenever they increased the rat's animal protein in their diet above 15%, the, the, cat, the rats that had tumors, the tumors increased in size. And whenever they decreased the animal protein in their diet below 15%, the tumors decreased in size. And this was really, this was like, a, he couldn't understand this. And so then they began to inject, inject rats with cancer. And then they began to experiment by increasing animal protein and decreasing animal protein. And they realized that in rats, this is how the whole study started, that they could turn on and off cancer growth in the body by increasing animal protein and decreasing animal protein. Now, the minute I saw that, I was like, well, I don't want to get cancer. And this seems to be a very, like it was proven beyond all scientific doubt that it was, the relationship was there. Then this guy started studying the world and he started studying the places in the world that had, you know, the highest rates of heart disease, the highest rates of, you know, cancer, all of these different things. And he began to realize that in the areas of the world, it was called the China study because one of the, one of the dictators in China actually ordered this study whenever he got cancer, I think. And, and they were able Able to prove the direct relationship between the um, countries in the world that have a, a huge in, uh, um, intake of animal protein and the direct relationship between, you know, not only obesity, but heart disease, um, even all kinds of stuff like um, MS, multiple sclerosis and autoimmune diseases and cancer in the countries that eat have a high concentration of animal protein in their diet. And then the countries that have a very low concentration of animal protein, especially casein, casein in whey, seem to be the biggest trigger for autoimmune diseases and cancer. And um, whenever, I, whenever I read that, I was like, well, I'm just going to go vegan because it was, it was irrefutable to me what I'd read. And I was like, even if they're wrong, even if they're, even if they're 10% wrong, the evidence was in front of me. And I'm a very factual person. I'm a very data-driven person. I always have been. When I saw the data, I couldn't ignore it. So I was like, well, I don't really care if I don't eat, you know, eggs or cheese or whatever, because that's all I was eating, you know, eggs and cheese and milk and stuff. And so from that, from that point on, I decided to go vegan. And then once I went vegan, I started bodybuilding and it was only just a short while afterwards I started bodybuilding and I started searching for some vegan bodybuilding program that would teach me how to get to the stage as a vegan athlete and it didn't exist. And because I'd been trying to start an online business or, you know, foraying into the world of online marketing for the kind of the previous five years, I kind of, I realized there was a massive gap in the market for a vegan uh, physique athlete trainer. You know, I thought, well, if I'm searching for this information, there must be thousands of other women worldwide or, you know, men or women worldwide searching for this information. And so I saw a gap in the market for a scalable online business program that, you know, for, for vegans. So I went vegan for two reasons. The first one, first and foremost was health. But then the minute I saw the gap in the market, that kind of cemented my decision to go vegan. And I, and I used, I, I saw it was a rising market and I went hell for leather creating the program. And so, and that's why I've had so much success because veganism has been on the rise and I have been able to use it to, to build a massive company, but also convert thousands and thousands and thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands of people worldwide to go more plant-based or to eat more plant-based or to eat more vegan food. So it, I would love to say it was for the animals. Like peace it and really love. wasn't. Yeah. Um, I do love animals, but I am more, I, I have a global, a worldview. There's also a lot of stuff in the economy, you know, like to, to the, the amount of effort that goes into feeding one cow to be killed for meat could actually feed 2000 people which is shocking. And so I was like, there's a lot of hungry people in the world. I have a very macro view of things. And whenever I saw the data, I just couldn't ignore it anymore. And I just decided to go vegan. Do you find as a vegan, you have to almost justify your choice for going vegan? Because a lot of people, I know from having worked with people who are vegan, they, from my experience anyway, it's almost, the, the, there's a lot of questions from people going towards them saying, well, why are you vegan? Why are you vegan? Why are you vegan? Because the whole peace and love, animals, crying and all this kind of stuff can come into it and, and obviously that hasn't been your choice but do you find almost that you have to justify your decision to go vegan i think that people will you know stop asking for your opinion when you stop offering it to them <laughs> like i don't you know it's it's like it's the same with homeschooling my kids you know there's there's people who i always ask um i always teach people to ask you know is this or this is how i evaluate it i say is this person asking um, to get data or are they asking to judge? And you will generally very quickly discern if someone is asking because they're genuinely interested or they're asking to judge. And the only reason why someone would be asking, well, why are you vegan? Um, to judge you would be if they feel vested in their own choice, especially men. Men get very, um, men get very attached, emotionally attached 
to their meat, you know, because yeah. me, man, me eat meat. You know, it's very much in our in our DNA as, you know, hunter, gatherer, slay the animal, eat the meat, ripping flesh from the bone, all this kind of stuff. You know, it's very much ingrained in the manhood of our culture that men eat meat. Take, a, take away a man's meat and my God, what does he have left? It's like my dad... <laughs> It's so funny. Like my actually, my stepmom was messaging me the other day, and my um my stepsister is doing my twelve day holiday charade, and she messaged me and she said, "Oh my god, I'm standing here watching your dad's face as Sarah is prepping, doing her meal prep for the week." She goes, "He's quite simply horrified." You know, he was looking at all the you know the chickpeas and the beans and the you know the vegan proteins and all the different stuff, and he's just like imagining a life without meat. But he's very much like me, man. We eat meat, you know. A real man eat meat kind of thing. So I think that if someone's coming to you and they are, they feel emotionally attached to the way they eat. And we do, we get so fearful. Don't take away the way that I eat or don't take away my beliefs around food. And so if someone comes to me with that kind of attitude, um, you can tell instantly and they're like, oh, well, why are you vegan? Or where do you get your protein? I go, yeah, there's protein, loads of things. And they go, well, do you not think that you need such and such? I go, yeah, yeah, you're probably right. You know, see, whenever someone attacks me or accuses me of something, happens all the time on Instagram and they go, you know, because the thing is vegan, right? Here's the thing, right? Whenever I first went vegan, I didn't realize that vegan means you don't eat or consume any animal products. So you don't wear leather, you don't eat honey, you don't wear wool or cashmere, you don't um, use any animal products that have been tested on animals, you don't get Botox or fillers or any of that kind of stuff. But <laughs> but here's the thing, but the an- angry preachy vegans who love to uh, slate you for shit like that will also then um, say, well, I'll say to them, where did you not take an antibiotic when you were sick recently? Oh, well, that's that's justified. <laughs> like, well, why is that justified? Because I was sick. You're like, yeah, but do you see the inconsistencies in your belief structure here? Like you're punishing me for doing something something. Oh, but that's elective. Botox is elective. So whenever people come to me and they go, so I am not fully vegan. I am plant-based. I do still consume animal, you know, I still wear leather. Um, I, I try my cruelty-free as much as I possibly can, but you know, I, I love Louis Vuitton. What can I say? Like, or Chanel, you know, like, and I don't, you know, and leather's a byproduct of the animal industry, honestly. So, you know, if, if we stopped eating animals, leather would cease to exist because it would be too expensive. So I'm happy with my decision to go right to the primary source and not eat the animals. And if anyone wants to argue with me, which they do all the time on Instagram, you're not a real vegan. You you should be called the sculpted plant-based. And I just go, yeah, you're probably right. Probably should. And then, but they fucking hate that. Then they get so angry. Right. That's it. I'm unfollowing you. And I'm like, bye. <laughs> this is not an airport. You do not need to announce your departure. You can just go. But they, they want to punish you. Punish you. They're she and they're so angry. And um, the reason why they're so angry is because I don't know how I get into slating the vegans here, but the reason why they're so angry is because they go, I have sacrificed. I have sacrificed for the animals and I don't eat salt vinegar crisps because they have milk powder in them. And you're over there. Not only are you not sacrificing, but you're making money from the term veganism. You haven't earned the word. Like they feel they own the word through their sacrifice. Whereas I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I'm just over here kind of doing my own thing and just, you know, not eating animals and, you know, educating people. And I, you know, just turning loads of people vegan. And so I think that, but then the, the carnivores as well get very attacking on the other side. I always thought it was just the vegans were angry, but let me tell you, it's the carnivores too. I get attacked. Like I, I have a friend called Michaela Peterson, who's Jordan Peterson's daughter. Yeah. I don't know whether you know Jordan Peterson. Michaela yeah. is one of my best friends and she is full red blooded carnivore. All she eats is beef because she has many autoimmune diseases. That's the only thing that she's used to, to, to solve herself. She and I are best friends. So every time she posts something on Instagram and I'll be like, you're so beautiful. I love you. And all of her carnivore people come on. What the fuck are you doing here? Sculpted vegan. Get the fuck off this page, you wanker. And I'm like, no, 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 sweetheart. Like, calm the fuck down. Seriously, Michaela and I are friends, but they can't understand how the vegans and the carnivores can be friends. It's kind of like the blacks and the whites and the north and the south. I'm like, seriously, chill the fuck out, people. Like, calm down. I'm just, you know, <laughs> you do you and I'll do me. And and we may not agree and everything, but can we still not be friends? It's, it's astounding to me that people get so upset and invested in the way they do things. I just think they need to work a bit harder. She and I always go, listen, just go into the gym and work a wee bit harder and work out all that anger and aggression. <laughs> Focus on something, you know, positive that'll move you towards a goal in your life. It'll kind of make you a wee bit of a happier person. And then, and then we'll talk. You know, I'm very chilled out about things. And I just, I, when someone tries to want, if someone wants to argue with me, I don't argue with people. I'm just like, yeah, you're probably right. 
Yeah, I think it's, uh, as you said, it can be a tribe, it can be a bias, it can be kind of that conflict side of things. And it is like, it's it's so easy to hide behind a keyboard as well. It's just like, yeah. just don't be a keyboard warrior. Like, just be sound. It's too easy. love a good argument as well. They love to get into a fight with you. They love to try and draw you into a right wrong. See the amount of people who don't have, people don't have conversations anymore. They just have right wrongs. There's no philosophical discussions. I am not interested in having a discussion with someone unless we're actually having a philosophical discussion. I will not get into content. I will not argue a point to be right I, and if someone wants to try and do that with me I just let them I'm like I just let them be right oh yeah you're probably right it's like yeah. this person isn't even capable of a philosophical discussion on you know on a process level they're so stuck in needing to be right I just let them be right so, <laughs> it's, it's, doesn't it's bother a, me it's a, it's a nice way to, to look at things that they, you want to have a proper conversation rather than reacting than rather yes. being reactive and uh, the last question, because I know we are tied for time, is in relation to your, you are an amazing uh, mother as well. Uh, and people and from working with moms and parents in particular, the, the one thing that always comes back is I have no time. And I'm sure you've been asked this question a million times uh, in relation to how do you make time from having a, an incredible company? You have your, your gym routine, you have your husband as well, but you also are homeschooling the kids and all that kind of stuff. How do you find time for that side of things and make time for yourself in, in, in all of that? Two things. Um, and again, it comes back to goal setting. It comes back to understanding your values and what's important to you. So I, I do this everywhere in my life. And so, um, th- well, the first thing I would say is whenever I went from being a full-time stay-at-home mom and homeschooling my, my four kids to you know starting this business and getting busier and busier and busier and bodybuilding, whatever, as soon as I could, I replaced myself. So as soon as I could, I hired a housekeeper and she only worked, you know, she worked first of all, five days a week for four hours a day. And that was all I could afford. And then, you know, as I could afford more, I I got her to stay on more. And Lorraine, my housekeeper is like my kid's second mother. You know, she really is. She is like the mother at home now. So I hired a housekeeper. And then um, as I earned more money, I, I outsourced more jobs. And now we have a full-time private chef at home as well. And so I, the, my, my main jobs at home, you know, during the kind of the nine to five, whenever my husband was working, were to take care of the kids and to, um, you know, prepare all the food. And so because nutrition is so important to me, those were the two areas that I expanded into. Full-time housekeeper. I have a weekend housekeeper as well. And I have a private chef. So when I'm home, Shane, I'm home and I'm present and I don't have to do the laundry or, you know, tidy up or cook the food or, you know, I love cooking on the weekend, but the rest of the time it's taken care of. And so that was one of the, I, one of the tips I always give people whenever they ask how, you know, how have I managed to build what I've managed to build? I always say to them, well, you have to get to a point where you, own, where you are doing only the things that you can do. And that is where, that's the point that I've now reached in my business and in my home life, in my business, I only do the things that only I can do. Everything else is done by the rest of the team. So I've, I, as soon as I could, I outsourced. And this comes back to what I was talking to you earlier about risking and growing. I've always invested in people. I've always invested in growth before I needed to grow. I've just taken on a full-time financial controller in the business because we are massively expanding next year. And I know that I need a full-time financial controller to keep you know all of the accounts up to date on a daily basis to manage cash flow to manage all the new businesses and you know so that's a big investment that we've just made and so I always have prepared to grow before I need to grow I'm not afraid to invest so that's the first tip that I give people whenever they are you know worried about time management in the beginning you have to do it all yourself but you have to try to get to a point where you can outsource everything that you're that isn't a good use of your time The second thing that I do or I teach people is you have to understand what your values are. You have to understand what is success for you in those areas. Many people don't even think to identify what success means for them as a parent. Whereas I sat down with my husband or even just by myself, first of all, in the beginning. And I said, you know, rather than running around with this feeling of guilt, which many parents do, I said to myself, what is what is important to me? What would constitute success for me as a parent? what would constitute success for me when I looked at my kids and I evaluated them, how would I know that I was parenting successfully? Because we don't send our kids to school. So there's no measurement of they got an A in geography or a B in math, or they, they, they made the hockey team or the rugby team. You know, that doesn't exist for us. Those are not measurements of success, which are very external measurements, which I never wanted to teach my kids. So my measurements of success for my kids are, 
you know, are they, you know, self-taught readers and writers, which they all are? Can they all read and write and multiply and do all of those things, you know, to a, a high level? Yes, they can. Are they all happy and joyful every single day? Yes. Do they wake up every day and have purpose and excitement for the day? Yes, they do. Are they good problem solvers? If they have a problem, do they know how to go and get information and find the answer to that problem? Have I taught them critical thinking and problem solving skills? Yes, I have. They all do really well at that. You know, do they have their individual interests, which they're passionate about, which I can help to fuel? Yes. Do they have friends? Are they able to socialize? Do they understand cause and effect? Do they understand the relationship of themselves in the world and how they affect other people? Yes. So I, I really sat down and was very conscious of what for me would constitute a successful child, what would constitute a successful childhood and how would that, how can I best prepare my children for adulthood? And I, I was very clear on that. And then what would constitute success for me? How would I feel that I was succeeding as a parent? How many hours a week would that require? Or would that be time spent with children? Or would that be, you know, do they, and even measurements such as like my my 15-year-old came to me the other week and he said to me, he came in and he sat in the bed and he said, can I talk to you? And he's he's a, a boy. And I said, yeah, sure. What is it? And he said, oh, just this thing happened online and it really upset me. And he like burst into tears and I was like, oh, come here. And I put my arms out and he crawled into my arms in bed beside me, 15. He's six foot one, like he's bigger than me. And he crawled into my arms and he cried and cried and cried and told me about the problem and what had happened. And I listened and I didn't try and change it. And I just, and then we evaluated it. And, and so for me, that success. My 15 year old, when he has an issue that happens online, comes to me and is open about that issue. And we can talk it through and we can sure he feels comfortable to do that. We have a deep and special connection. I do with all my kids. So that for me, Shane, is success. So I think that, you know, many people say, well, how do you manage it all? How do you fit it all in? But what they're really saying is, you know, like, how do you feel happy every day with what you do? How do you, how do you know you're succeeding? Well, you only know you're succeeding if you know what your measurement is. And many people say, I'm ruining my kids. Oh my God, imagine not sending your kids to school and not giving them the opportunity to mix with 600 people every day. Imagine them not having the opportunity to play rugby. My husband was a professional rugby player. What if they never play for their country? Well, I don't really care if they ever play for their country. If they showed an interest in rugby, well, then I will give them all of the tools to become a rugby player. But I never had a, a, a goal for my children other than you know, personal measurements of success for them. Um, I never had a path that I, I saw for them in terms of being, you know, a doctor or a lawyer or being a famous rugby player or any of that. I was very happy for them to shape their own paths and for me to be there to support them. And then, you know, once I, once I was able to identify what constitutes success for me, then every day I just measure, am I succeeding against my goal and, or am I failing? And if I'm failing, then I, I make changes to bring myself back on track, just like I do with my diet or with my cardio or with my training or with my business or with my, you know, competing or whatever. I'm always measuring and evaluating, measuring and evaluating and making changes based on the data. And I carry that through into my parenting and I carry it through into my relationship with my husband. I carry it into every single area of my life. Um, I think if people become less vested in the outcome and much more playful in the process and um, they just keep working and working and working towards something and, and, and have less fear around it, they, they generally will find that a lot of their, their fears and a lot of their things that hold them back will, will drop away as they, it's, I can't even, don't even know how to sum up what I'm saying here, but as they move towards something or as they build something greater in their lives, they will find um, themselves achieving more and more and more and being less fearful in the process. I love that. I love, I love the, the big sentence I took out of that was being present when you are with your kids. Mm -hmm. Like I don't have kids, but I think that's especially now when it's so easy just to have like phones or Kindles or Playstations or whatever going on. It's uh, very, very important to like, especially with what's going on as well. Like mm -hmm. there's so many distractions um, and it's really, really important to like for the, for the both the parent and the, the kids to be to be present. And as you said, it's an amazing bond that you have with your 15-year-old for, for your 15-year-old to be able, especially as a lad, lad are not yeah. great at uh, expressing feelings, uh, shall we say. Uh, Kim, I cannot thank you enough for being so honest. And so just being Kim on uh, the, 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 uh, the podcast today, where can people find out about yourself? Where can people find out about your programs and the podcast? Well, if anybody wants to uh, message me personally, I answer all my own direct messages messages on Instagram. My Instagram is at the sculpted vegan. Um, my company where we have many, many, many different bodybuilding programs is the sculpted vegan.com. And my podcast was actually recently rebranded as the Kim Constable podcast. So it's available on iTunes, um, on 
Stitcher, Podbean, Spotify, um, and also on our website. So you can also uh, listen to me babble on for hours and hours on end. People tend to binge the podcasts. Once yeah. they've listened to one, they, they tend to get into them and start binging them. So um, I love I love recording the podcast. It's one of my favorite things to do is talk, as you've probably gathered. <laughs> You're like, she was definitely a guest. I didn't need to ask many questions of. So um, never shut me up. But yeah, so The Sculpted Vegan uh, is where you'll find me uh, first and foremost. And uh and everything else is, is on the website. I highly recommend going over to listen to, to, to Kim's podcast. I've listened to a good few episodes at this stage and some of the guests are, are pretty good. There's Brett Contreras on there as well, which is pretty impressive. So mm-hmm. Kim, thank you so much for coming on. So much, thank you so much for giving up so much, so much of your time. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. If you've enjoyed that episode at all, guys, please do tag Kim and I up on your story. The more reviews you leave up on iTunes and the more shares, the more guests I can get on, the more incredible guests like Kim and everyone else I can get on to the podcast. So please continue to support the podcast as always. You guys have been incredible. So I hope you enjoyed that episode and I will talk to you very soon.